annual kickoff speech at our corporate meeting, one of the first things that I do is I invite my staff to leave the company. Now you may say, is he crazy? Well, I don't think I am. While uh, my, that very authentic offer, a couple people take me up off it uh, up occasionally. The majority of people are overwhelmingly delighted to work for our company. And that's what I want to talk about today. How do we create a continuous culture of contentment that's sustainable? You see, we have a big problem in our industry. In the next 18 months, the need for caregivers is going to overtake the need for retail workers. It's an incredible dilemma. And we have huge turnover in our industry, north of 150%. Unemployment is at a historic low. Now, some of you may say, well, my strategy is I'm just going to poach, steal, kidnap people from my competitive company, make them an offer they can't refuse. It's one strategy, but here's why I don't do that. About 20-some years ago, I was at a conference very much like this. I, let me, and I, I had a care manager that worked for me three years previous. And she'd left my employment. She was making about $8 an hour. And at this conference, I saw her. And she said, Dwayne, it's great to see you. I'm, hey, it's great to see you. What are you doing now? She goes, I'm now vice president of operations overseeing a $100 million portfolio. And why I was generally happy that this person had gone from an activities director making $8 an hour to overseeing a $100 million portfolio, I walked away from that conversation and I thought, wow. Is our industry just recycling people from company to company, paying them more money, hoping, no, not hoping, praying they do a good job? And then what happens to innovation? What happens to the creativity if we're just recycling people from company to company? And I made a vow to myself at that point that I wasn't going to do that. I wasn't going to hire my managers from other assisted living companies. So I looked at all kinds of industries. I looked at the restaurant industry. I looked at the retail industry. And one of the things that I found was pretty obvious. The hospitality industry, the hotel industry, had a lot of parallel skills, the core competencies that we needed. But here was the problem. Even with hotel managers, they only brought 70% of the core competencies to the table. The 30% that they didn't have was obvious. They didn't have the clinical, the medical, the knowledge of aging and Alzheimer's and all those things. So I made a controversial decision that we were going to have our managers, before they took any responsibility on, I wanted to give them 100 days of training. Not 100 hours, 100 days. It was incredibly expensive. Now you may say, that's crazy. You know, I'm just going to go out and hire somebody from another, another company, then they come with those skills, and I don't have to give them a training, and in three days they can be running a building. Why would you do that, Dwayne? Well, the answer is pretty obvious. What we ended up with was a more professional, more intelligent, a better business person. But beyond that, beyond that, they didn't bring the baggage of their old assisted living companies. They were new. They were creative people. I call it the weaving of the quilt because they brought these experiences from this other company. To Each person brought a piece for the quilt. But it doesn't stop there. You see, it's not just good enough to hire people. You've got to keep them. You've got to create a culture that is important. And so one of the things that we did is we formed a foundation. Our own foundation for our employees called the Potato Soup Foundation. See, the Potato Soup Foundation is a very personal story to me. I was the youngest of four kids. Um, my mom was a line cook. We were poor. Not like poor like you couldn't buy the new Jordans poor, but poor like we didn't have food. And so one day my mom came home from work in our tiny one-bedroom apartment. She walked in the door and she goes, we don't, have an, we don't have a lot of money. We don't have any money. And as a smart aleck 16-year-old kid, I said, well, what's new? And she walked over to the refrigerator in our tiny little one-bedroom apartment. She opened the the refrigerator door, and I can see that light going on. 
and it had an onion, a cube of butter, and a can of condensed milk. And she shut the refrigerator and she said, I'm going to have to steal some potatoes from work, and I think we can eat potato soup for two weeks. Now, shocking statement. You know, my mother had never stolen anything in her life. She said, I'll pay him back with interest. Now, during that two weeks that we ate that potato soup, some of the most profound business advice I ever got. She said, you know, I know you're going to take on some level of responsibility and you're probably going to manage staff and you're going to rise to some level of greatness, but here's the thing I want you to know. You have to be smart enough to know that from time to time your employees are going to be in dire need and need your help. And if you're there for your employees, your employees will always be there for you. Incredibly insightful words. The Potato Soup Foundation has gone on to pay for medical expenses, to pay for education, to pay for funerals, to pay for housing and courses of domestic violence. But here's what I never anticipated would happen. There was a miracle of sorts. We offered that if, if line staff wanted to contribute to the Potato Soup Foundation through automatic payroll deduction, it didn't matter if it's 50 cents or a dollar or $10 or whatever, two weeks, hey, we didn't push them, we didn't recruit them, we said, hey, it's open to you. Today, Today, almost 500 people contribute. And that's become their family, their culture. It's not us shoving that on them. That's their culture of their company. They're providing for each other. But it doesn't stop there. You see, about 15 years ago, I got up, I read the newspaper, I went in, I read some training materials, and then I talked to a care manager who was saying, I'm so stressed out about my job. And I thought about all this turmoil in our world, and I thought, where do our people go? Where do our employees go to recharge? They're stressful jobs. People dying, people combative, Alzheimer's conditions, where do they go? What if I, what if I created my own self-development conference? And we did, we created a conference called EPIC. EPIC stands for Empower People, Inspire Consciousness. It has nothing to do with work, nothing to do with aging, nothing to do with seniors. In fact, if you're caught talking about your business, your census, your NOI, any of those good things, you're fined. $25. Guess where it goes? Potato Soup Foundation. So EPIC has had some of the most profound A-listers in the country. We've had over 100 speakers. We had Sylvester Sloan last year, Deepak Chopra, Gina Davis, Susan Sarandon, Carlos Santana, Tim Kennedy Jr. We have seven or eight great speakers every year. People say, this is the way I recharge. They have profound experience over that three days. But it doesn't stop there. You see, before I started Aegis, I worked for another senior housing company. And I know this may shock you, but I was an idea machine. I would go into my CEO and I'd say, hey, I have this idea. Oh, okay. Hey, I have this idea. Next day, I have this idea. And after about four or five idea sessions with Dwayne, he said, ah, idea moratorium on Dwayne. No more. No more. So I took my ideas and I walked dejected back to my office and I'd stuff them in this black box. And guess what happened to that black box? When I started my own company, they become the principles, the hallmarks, the foundation, the business plan of our company. But I wanted a learning from that. And I thought, hmm, how did I feel about that? So we put a black box in every one of our communities, but that wasn't good enough. We then put a process owner in charge of the black box. We have a person that said, hey, it's black box time. You know, any day you can put an idea in here. That's not good enough. Then we started publishing the ideas. That wasn't good enough. Then we started financially rewarding people for the ideas. Some of our best programmatic ideas in the company have come from the black box. Now, here's the situation. People don't see it as my company, as the founder, because they have their ideas in play. They see it as their company. But that's not good enough. But Three years ago, I was walking through our corporate office and I was reading a brochure. And it was a recruiting brochure. And I was walking through the office, I stopped and looked at, around the office and said, well, this is a nice little flat piece of material, but it's telling all these great things about our company, but can the 
can our potential employees really see it? And does this office really speak to our corporate soul? I had to be honest with myself. I had to say, no, it doesn't. So guess what? I sold that office. I bought another office twice the size. And I sat down with the architects and the designers and I said, I want to build a building that shows my corporate soul. They looked at me a little weird. And I said, I want people to know that we have philanthropy and we have a purpose wall. I want people to see our mission, our purpose, our values. Yes, and I even built a tree house in the backyard because I wanted people to be childlike and have fun. That's become one of our most popular conference rooms. In fact, vendors call now and say, I'm coming over on Thursday. Can we meet in the tree house? So who ha I wanted people to see that we're disruptive. Who has a chopper in their office with some of the world's most profound thinkers that really define disruption? And something else happened. See, in our old office, when we interviewed employees, our closing rate was about 63, 64%. Guess what it is in the new office? 95%. You think that's an accident? I don't think it is. But it doesn't stop there. You see, I know many of you, many of you do great things for your employees. You know, the birthday parties and the anniversaries and the trips and the so on. A lot of fun things. But guess what? Today, today in this environment, people want more than fun. They have a social conscience. Last year, I led a march on civility on Washington, D.C. I was the chairman of the march with a young man next to me, Ken Wadicki, who's the head of the Free Hugs movement. There was hundreds of people that marched. I was able to speak from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial where with Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech. It was broadcast live on C-SPAN for over six hours to over eight million people. Guess what? I also brought 100 care managers. People said it was one of the most profound experiences of their lives. They could not believe that I would take them to this conference. But it doesn't stop there. You see, every year, every holiday season, our corporate office turns into a retail store. We give away coats, we give away toys, we give away clothing, we give away food, we give away cash to our staff and their families. Over 600 people come through the doors that day. Our corporate executives are the workers. And for those of you who are in a Location that you can't get to the corporate office, we have a, a mobile Winterfest, that's what we call it, Winterfest RV, that goes to your community. People so appreciate that we celebrate their family with them. But it doesn't stop there. You see, I was talking to a care manager one day, and she was getting off shift, and I said, hey, where are you going? She goes, I'm going to go play the Mega Millions Lottery. I say, oh, come on, what's your chance of winning? She goes, you know, it's just fun, Dwayne, and there is an opportunity someday that I'm going to win, and I'm going to do this. And I, okay, good luck. And I walked away from that conversation, and I said, what if we had our own lottery? I have to tell you, when I floated this to my senior management team, they thought I'd kind of lost it. I said, no, we could have our own lottery, because what if we use this and told every employee that as long as you have one year in service, you're eligible for the lotto, and every year after, you get an additional ticket. More chances. If you're a five-year employee, you have a chance to win is one in 250. Not one in 300 million, one in 250. We give away over $70,000 net. $70,000. Top prize is $50,000 in that. We pay the taxes. It's life-changing money for these people. We do it twice a year. People bought cars. They've gone on vacations. They've bought homes. And yes, yes, even some people have left the company, which is okay. Now, I know a lot of you may be saying, geez, Dwayne, this seems like great PR, um, good ideas, but who cares? Why should I do this? Well, first of all, we've been voted best company to work for by various publications 14 times. As Bob mentioned, we were a top 50 company 
out of over 650,000 companies voted on. Guess who recognizes that? Our staff. So our recruitment efforts are better. Our families. Because you know what our families say? Man, if you take that good care of your staff, I know, I know you're going to take good care of my mom. Because the greatest barrier we have in our industry is trust. So it works. But here's the warning I want to give you. Culture's tough. It's an it's a expectation of every one of my senior team and every employee that every day they go out and try to find a creative benefit to improve the lives of our staff and improve the lives of our culture. Second thing I will tell you is that not everybody agrees on culture. I've had to actually end relationships with partners who didn't see culture the same way as I do. And the last thing I'll tell you, if you're a VP of ops in this room or a VP of HR, and you're thinking, I'm going to go take back these ideas. I'm going to implement this. I'm going to change the culture of our company. If your CEO does not get on board, if your CEO is not the driver of cultural change, you're doomed. Your CEO has to be the champion. So I'm going to throw out a challenge to you. You know, don't just try to get people involved in your great capitalistic goals of growing your company and being a good company. I challenge you to create a phenomenal, phenomenal culture. I thank you.